Hello, my name is Alan Cohen. Today I'm interviewing uh, Tom Major, who's a professional drummer, producer, and writer. He's been playing and performing for a very long time, and he'll give us some of his insight on, first of all, his career, where he's at now, and how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting live musicians. So I welcome you, Tom. Thanks for taking taking your time to join us. I know you're booked all day long, running house. Al, I've, got, I've got nothing but time right now, Al. <laughs> time is on your side. I wish time you wrote is, that song, right? That's right. <laughs> So, Tom, we know each other, uh, you know, maybe about 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. Why don't you, uh, you know, give our audience a, a, a little uh, bit about your career, how you started, you know, in a nutshell, and, and let us know what you're up to. Yeah, I'm a native New Yorker, born in Brooklyn. My dad was a jazz drummer. I got the bug early. I, I ended up moving to Boston to go to, to Berkeley College for a little bit. Right. Lived in Boston for a while, played with a lot of different people. Moved back down to New York. Lived in Manhattan, where we hooked up. I was playing with Bo Diddley and Carly Simon a little bit with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And, you know, all the, the guys around New York just kind of freelancing around for about eight or nine years. And then uh, I put a, a, my original band together. I started writing songs, and I thought, oh, let, me, let me try my hand at the original thing. So I put a band together up on Martha's Vineyard. I wanted to get out of Manhattan for a summer. Mm. Went to the vineyard for, this, for the summer, and I ended up, you know, just having a great time and by the end of the end of the uh summer the band was just rocking and i've been doing that now for like 27 years that's like my main main project is doing my original band and we've got eight albums out and oh wow i didn't know that nice, yeah nice little following around the northeast and some other parts of the country so that, that you say that's your main thing so when you're doing these yeah. uh, live performances mainly your live band or you're doing uh, cover bands too? mostly it's the live mostly it's the original band and then I've been filling it in since I moved up to the, to the uh, little ones there. Look, it, it's all good. And it's all life. Man. Go back and forth. It's all good. <laughs> this is called the quarantine interview. That's right. Allowed to so, get the dogs, look, everybody out. That's the toddlers waking up from now. We're trying to keep them quiet. He's good for another minute. <laughs> so, so I moved up to moved up to the Berkshires, and you know the original original band N Train. His name of the band N Train. You know, started to slow down a little bit, like all, you know most bands did. And I started to sort of, uh, you know, play with a lot of different people up here. And I got involved in some great projects. There's this one, one project, this guy is a production manager over at the Colonial Theater up in Pittsfield. And we do these big shows up there. He puts on all these, like, these big events. We did like a, a, Santa, a tribute to Santana's 50th anniversary at Woodstock. We did a Paul Simon's Graceland album show. Nice. I put together a show doing a 50th anniversary tribute to the Who's Tommy album, which is off the hook. Really cool. Killer, killer. Killer. And I got this other band called Four Sticks that I used to have in New York. And I put a version together of, of that band up in the Berkshires doing uh, like an old, like old school Zeppelin, like jamming kind of bluesy Zeppelin, your know, first couple of albums kind of Zeppelin show. And then I got another band called the, uh, the Grateful Dread doing a reggae version, all reggae versions of Grateful Dead songs. <laughs> and then I've, I've got this uh, one of my most fun bands is a band called the Rejuvenators which is like a New Orleans funk band it's my, mainly like a, a, an excuse for me to play meters tunes oh, okay. and that, so all those bands work up here and another band doing a, a it's called Steal Your Peach sort of a uh, Almond Brothers slash Grateful Dead show and so with, with, with all those bands, I'm working all the time, all in, you know, up in the Berkshires area, southern, uh, you know, and northern New England, uh, Albany area, the, the, you know, the capital region. And I don't have to travel that far, an hour, two hours. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working pretty regularly that, you know, I'm doing like private lessons, which I've always done. And I've been lucky enough to get, uh, you know, some studio work. There's a great studio up, up here, like 10 minutes from my house called Pilot Recording Studios. This was this guy, Will Schillinger, Schillinger who had his Pilot Studios in New York City where, where I recorded a Bo Diddley record. Oh, wow. and, uh, and it just so happened that after 9-11, Will moved his operation up here to the Berkshires, bought an old church, and has like amazing studio in there. So he's, wow. producing, he's producing stuff, and you know, I'm kind of on the short list of drummers that he calls to go in and do you know, recording and demos records and whatnot. So... With all of that, I've been, you know, I've been able to piece together a nice little career 
having a good time playing a lot of great music with a lot of great musicians and I'm not stressing, you know, life is good out. Let me just touch on one or two things and then yeah. we'll catch up. First of all, your father was a jazz drummer. Did he, was he a performer also as like you? Yeah, he was, you know, he was as a young man, he was a, a full-time jazz drummer in the New York city area. And then, you know, got married, had the kids and was a weekend gigging drummer for as, as long as he was alive. Right. You know? And so, he turned me on to like all the, the cool stuff. I, I grew up listening to Miles Davis and Gene Krupa thinking that's what music was, wow. you know? So it was, I had a good start on that. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, like we, we all did it. We found the Beatles in 1964 and, and that just took me on a whole nother level, a whole nother direction and never looked back, you know? Yeah. But, so from there, I mean, uh, we'll jump in a few years. Then yeah. you went to a Berkeley college of music. I, I forgot. I think you mentioned that to me and I didn't really yeah. Because I graduated there my, uh, myself in 1970, 1978. I went from 74 to 78 and graduated. With, we were with, there at the same time. We were. He we were there at the same time. I was, there, I was there like seven, uh, 70, 74. To, I only I did a couple of years, 74 to 76. Oh, wow. That's but, do you remember a band called the Alston Funk Band? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, what's his Jamie, name? Jamie Glazer. Right, it was it was the album uh, Carl, I just Carl Bova? The other day, I, I think I'm going to interview him too. Who, Carl Bova or Jamie? No, so Jamie Glazer. Jamie Glazer was in the band. Carl Bova was in the band. Those old guys that I grew up with, they, we were all from the same high school on Long Island. You were the original drummer with that band? Not, not the original drummer. I was the second guy that came in. Oh man, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you play, and then yeah. uh, I know uh, Mick Gaffney. Mick Gaffney was also in the band. Oh. Make it and play it Nick, Nick and I still still play together every once in a while, and and after Where, after all some fun, he comes uh, up. Yeah, he'll come up. You know, the Alb he's from Alb the Albany area, oh, so right. sometimes sometimes he'll call me to do gigs up in that area if he's got you know club date or whatnot. But we had a, a fusion right. band, a fusion band together. Me and Mick and and uh, you right. know a bunch of great players. Danny Moore, I don't know if you know that guy. Great players yeah. doing all the old old school like. Fusion stuff in the early '80s, late '70s, early '80s. Weather Report and Chick Corea and all that. Oh man! So yes, Mick Gaffney and I go way back. Good buddies. Gave me two, two of my favorite guitar players still yeah. to the state. Right? That's what a small world, babe. <laughs> All right, so you went from that, um, and then I met you actually when you were doing Bo Diddley. So you mentioned right. Diddley. How long did you play with Bo? Uh, I think I was in Bo's band for about seven years. Seven years? I did. Yeah, no. yeah, and, and and you know we were. Like you know, they, Bo did a lot of gigs with just pickup bands around the country here and there. We we did all the the bigger shows, the the festivals, uh, the overseas shows, TV yeah. shows, and and I was lucky enough to get on on a the he did a record. It was like his 40th anniversary in the business record that that Warner Brothers did for him. Oh, Big wow. star studded record with, you know, Eric uh, who was a uh, uh, Johnny Johnson played keyboards on it, Dave Keys. Yeah, they, uh, still uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like all these these great players that was on the record. So, so we did that, and then uh, and then I moved up to to do my my original band full time, but we, I still stayed in touch with Bo. And whenever Bo Diddley had gigs around New England, he would they would hire my band N Train to open up for oh. him, and then be his backup band. Oh, what happened to Deb Debbie Hastings? That she oh. didn't get the bass gig. Yeah. No, not 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 when do, not when we did shows with Entrain. They weren't crazy about that idea, but Bo was. He had a blast playing with us. Yeah, we have all, his, okay. all his drums and percussion. Be around on on online also. She's still very active doing. Oh things. yeah, yeah. Debbie's doing great. She's yes, doing great. yes. And we had a we had a great run with with the Bo Diddley band with Debbie and yeah. Marco and you know Dave Keys. Lindsey yeah. was in the band for a while and. And uh, I got into that band. Uh, I think from Jim Satin. Jim Satin. That's right. Prince of Darkness. <laughs> I think he just had twins. No. Yes, or something, or a baby. There's two more of him? Uh, yeah. No. God bless him. <laughs> God bless him probably too, straightened him out, you know? Good for him, man. It's probably great. straightened us all out, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, the, ba the babies do that, man. They keep you focused on what's important. Good. That's that's beautiful. So then, then you start playing because then you uh, at that time you you played in my original band, which was Alloyed and the Interplanetary Invasion. I still have a great picture. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll grab it out and show you. Uh, uh, it's just me and you at CBGB's. Oh, please send me that. Black and white, and and you're there. Um, 
and you're there as well, right behind me, like keeping the time down. I'm oh, going to put it out and share it on the screen in do, one minute. Do. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. So, so uh, that's how I made And then I kind of lost touch with you. You know, Yeah. Well, I stayed I in New York. Things you do on the teams. Yeah, I was in New York for about seven years. And then, you know, my, my band end train started becoming pretty popular in, in the Northeast area. And I decided just to give it a go. And I moved up to the vineyard full time. Wow, nice. I, li- I lived up there for, for quite a while. How did you go up and, there? Were you originally from up there? No, no, I'm really originally from Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn. I, I, I bought grew up Brooklyn. On, on, I bought grew, Brooklyn too. Yeah, grew up in Belmore, Long Island. Wow, I didn't uh, know. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker. Yeah, man. But, uh, but so I was living on the vineyard and working, working my band, the original band. And, you know, in its heyday for about 18, 20 years, we were working like 160, 180 dates a year. It's really amazing that you could have a, a live band playing that much. We, we were just rocking. And, and it was, you know, it was great music. It was a six-piece band. I had a two-piece crew. We had a, you know, RV and a homemade tour bus and, and doing like a real nice, you know, little regional success story, you know, on a, on a small scale. But we were, we, do, we all did well, you know, bought houses and the whole deal. And then 2008 hit and things kind of like slumped off a bit. And that's when I started like moving around, working with different people. And, you know, that kind of led me to the, to the Berkshires and, yeah. uh, and, and came up here not knowing what to expect. And I found so many great musicians and great situations. I've got like a, I've had a regular Wednesday jazz gig for the last four years, which has awesome. been great. Gets me off my butt to practice and try to get better. So, you know, I'm, I'm challenged and I have great our resources to play with some amazing musicians right. and I'm having, I'm having a great time. Everything's been cool. What, yeah. a, what a great yeah. story. Yeah. So, um, the fact, I mean, you are a writer too and a producer. So uh, obviously uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic going on, I'm sure it's taken a hit and you probably don't know the next gig that you're going to play. Yeah, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm seeing more gigs fall off the calendar than are coming on the calendar. Even even some of my summer shows are in jeopardy. But we, you know, we lost so far probably eight weeks of solid work and a lot of money. And uh, you know, every every now we're booking gigs for the fall, hoping that we'll be okay in the fall. But a lot of venues and a lot of the festivals are kind yeah. of like have cold feet about like con- committing to like July and August. So. I'm hoping that we're going to be done in the next couple, two, three weeks. But, you know, I just don't know, Al. It's like we're all just scratching our head, you know, and just so, saying. Uh, that leads me to believe. So, though, obviously, your, your, your main source of income, your revenue stream, I mean, you have it from a few different areas, but it is really dependent on live performances. Yeah. What, yeah. what does a musician such as yourself, who, whose main area is that, you know, h- how do you plan for something like this? Obviously, you can't. But no, you really can't. It's really difficult. What? I mean, we, we're trying to do, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're attempting to live stream some shows from out here. And it's like, you're a not going to make the revenue, but you're, you're not going to be allowed. They have donate. Do, there's a donate button and people are kind, you know, they'll throw, they'll throw the musicians 10, 20, 30 bucks, whatever they can afford, you know, mm-hmm. and that helps a little bit. And, and, you know, there are some people that are really trying to get that uh, thing going on a serious level where they can look at it as another income stream. People are afraid to go out, but they want to hear live music. It's like sit back in your living room and, you know, do whatever you want and watch a great show and help the musicians out and throw them, throw 20 bucks, you know, for, for a, a, what would be a ticket price, you know? Right. So there's a place out here, the, the barn in Egremont that's been doing that. They've streamed some of, some of our shows that they've recorded in the last year or two. Um, we'll see how that goes, but I'm hoping this, this is something that's going to, you know, just be for another couple of weeks and then we can get back to work again. But, that's you know, very optimistic. That's uh, but I don't know because you know, as 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 things change, you know, it's a whole brave new world, and we just don't know, you know, how much we're going to be able to get back. Yeah. And sometimes when government takes our things away, yeah, we don't get them back so easily. So, That's who knows if it's going to be a. a um, a looked down upon to gather three or four or 500 people in a, in a venue to enjoy a show. I mean, I, I just, a live know. nation, uh, you know, and the, all these yeah. big venues uh, or yeah. promoters that are 
It's just, you know, I mean, I don't think it's going to be a thing of a past, the past, but it might be really some time before it's back to what we called normal. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's ever going to get back to where it was, but maybe so, it's going to be the new normal. Yeah, let me ask you this question, though. Um, so, so you did that, but you're also a producer. So are yeah. you, do you have your own home studio where you produce tracks? Yeah, I've got a little home like studio, and, and, you know, and I work in other studios as well. You know, so and, you can still uh, go to other studios at this yeah. point? Yeah, I'm still working in some other studios. And uh, so you know, recording in, in like, for instance, you said the other guy's studio, he's still recording at, at this yeah. time. Yeah. Wow. yeah we, we, I did a record date last, last, last week, so okay. three days in the studio and you know, it was a rhythm right. section. All different musicians come in the door. Yeah. Everybody's coming in four piece rhythm section. We just wash our hands a lot, stay away from each other. It's a nice big room. So <laughs> we can spread right. out. Hey, and you're yeah. in the drum booth. <laughs> I'm in the drum booth, so you know, whatever, you know. So wow, that's incredible. Hopefully, hopefully that that'll still keep going, so we can still maintain some some semblance of an income. But you know, um, uh, like like most musicians are right now in my position, we're, you know, we're applying for assistance wherever we can, you know, for a small business, yeah. uh, you know, grants and whatnot, and you know, live gig musicians and independent contractors were all, you know, scrambled around trying to get some of that five gazillion dollars you're giving away to the yeah. corporates. <laughs> That's incredible. That's crazy. I got an idea. How about this yeah, one? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do this. Okay. They got like, what is it? A couple trillion dollars to give away to the, the banks and the, the corporations. Right. And they're going to each give us like $1,200. No, 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 no. Keep it $1,200. How about, all 230, 238 million people in the United States all get $1 million. That's a drop in the bucket to this $2 trillion that they give into the corporations and the banks, right? $1 million each. You want to stimulate the economy? You want to see people get out of debt? You want to see... Stimulated city here, yeah, don't bear look out. <laughs> right? $1 million each. It's nothing to them. It's just another little blip on the screen. What do you think? I, I I love it. You like it? Okay, good. Well, Let's congressman, if you could find them. <laughs> they're all hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there, there has to be, you know, like you said, the 1,200 is, is far from anything. I mean, it's a good gesture, but it ain't really a good gesture. No, it's nothing. I mean, about, Canada, oh, Canada is just uh, announced they're giving every, every Canadian city citizen $2,000 a month for at least the next three months, for at least the next three months and, and beyond, if they need it. And what about if they took care of the public utilities? You know, the gas, the electric. Oh, that should be a given. That should, should be a given. They should freeze rent. They should take freeze rent, freeze mortgages. You know, until they get everything back on and up and running again. How do they expect? How do they expect people to live? It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the the thing is, hopefully we do get running again. I mean, I'm on the other side of the conspiracy side. I don't even want to get into that live here. I know. We'll, uh, you we'll, know, we'll, I, we'll I, have a private conversation about that. Al. Yeah, yeah. When we, <laughs> when we stop recording about being even bigger than than any of this. That's true. So, I mean, that's dark doom and gloom. I I try to keep positive, like you are. I do too, man. I I no. think we're all, I think we're all going to be fine. It's going to take a minute, and we're going to have to rework the way we we you know uh, you know uh, manage and 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 operate through the through the new system. So, with, with all that being said, for the music industry itself, I mean, we are seeing more people playing from their living rooms. There was a concert with Elton John raising money. There's all these other things where everybody's playing, performing at a home. Do you think that's something that's going to continue as much? You know, when we do get yeah. maybe that stable position, do you yeah. think that it forced me to really work this platform more? And yeah. that's why I'm reaching out to you. That's one thing. Yeah. But, you know, I kind of like not having to go. Uh, I, I teach at uh, one of the universities. Yeah. But, but I tell you the truth, the, the, the class, I have 25 students, they all showed up, you know, and they all did their homework. But the yeah. thing is, I met them in person. So I, I still have a, a personal touch with them. So when I see them there, then they close off, they come back at the end of the, the, the class. I still have like a personal right. connection to them in a way that if it was a new class that I never met in person, you know, it, it, 
you know, I'm missing a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, so, I hear you. But do you think that, once again, to talk about this and the music industry, that this is also, you know, something that's going to stay more, uh, musicians performing for other people and, and, and continuing that way? I think it's a possibility. I mean, you know, years ago, I used to joke about, you know, wouldn't it be great to have like a little studio, your own studio barn in your backyard, a little soundstage that you can set up and do like holographic performances. So you can, don't have to have, ever leave your, your property and you just like send it out there to venues all over, the, all over the world, right? I think maybe some of that may be happening now where, okay, we've got a cool little soundstage and let's just, I mean, set up a way to, to get a revenue stream coming in that's but to, all about but to be able but to be able to stream live like when, we're not just showing a a performance from last month but we're actually playing and we're talking to the people wherever they are and maybe there's they're in their house maybe they're in a small theater maybe they're in a you know uh, i'm not sure how that will pan out but that, that's just one possibility that we may be relegated to not actually being in the same room with with the audience you know i'm not really sure right well it's, uh, it's a brave new world <laughs> It's a brave new world. Also, I was uh, reading an article about one of the uh, new owners of TuneCore. I know the original guy, but now there's another one, and they asked him about independent artists, and he's saying, just keep releasing records. Now's the time. Get all your past records. Get your instrumental. Get this and that, and just keep releasing more digital music. Right at this point i mean it's a it's a small revenue stream digital yeah. streaming <clears throat> but it's, it's another way to get your music out there and continue yeah. you know yeah. like you can't do this so you probably got a lot of stuff in the in you know the can that you're not really you have your jam tapes you know and this and that that you could put together as you know uh band material that you're releasing with all those bands i'm sure you have plenty of, uh, of I got time. yeah I've got a lot of, you know, original songs that never made it to records for, right. for my band N Train. I can go back and polish them up and release songs here and there. And, you know, you know, truth being told, I do I make a little bit of revenue coming in from, from CD sales and the digital stuff, you know, dribs yeah. and drabs. But there's still people buying my records. So, you oh, know, nice. uh, that, that obviously helps. And you're right. I think the more stuff we can get out there, the better that that revenue stream can be for, for musicians. Yeah. But, but you know, I'm, I'm the amazing gigging machine now. Right. I know I, that I, I, I'm, I'm the live drummer that the ever ready drummer that never stops. Right. You know, my, my whole thing is like bringing live music to people, live energy, you know, and that's what I do best. And that's what I love most about the music business. So to, to, imagine that that may not be there the way it was is a little disconcerting yeah. i'm seeing optimistic and i think we're going to be okay and it's going to come back maybe slightly different maybe slightly smaller numbers i'm not really sure but the thought of not being able to have that experience playing live with people in the room feeling the energy and like feeding, feeding that, that, that whole like you said the streaming live from the barn but there's nothing like the crowd you know no, kicking, kicking back and, Instant love, back and forth. That's what entrainment is. Oh, like you give, you give, like the law of entrainment is all about energy just circulating around and 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 becoming you know larger than than any one one thing. So the audience picks up on the music and the music becomes more energetic because the people are feeding it back. And before you know it, you have a whole room full of people all entrained, all like one, feeling and moving and grooving to the music. And there's nothing like that experience. Yeah. You know? most important so, thing I think. So uh, I guess in in closing that's what you would say. What what what's your little uh, words of inspiration? I mean, I I think you said it already, but yeah. if you could wrap it into that one sentence or one closing uh you know, one. set of inspiration to to give us some energy to continue. Yeah, I think I think the main thing is to not succumb to the fear and not shut down our world for the wrong reason. We need to live, we need to embrace each other as, as brothers and sisters, not to look away from each other and repel from each other in fear. We need to enjoy life, we need to go out and enjoy music, we need to be able to go out and share things together and smile together and get back to living again, because that's really what's the most important thing about being on this earth. You know, live, play with your babies, play your music, Oh, dance sing 
right? You're killing me. You're a beautiful guy. I haven't talked to you in so long. Let, let me do one thing in closing. One thing in closing. You ready for this one, Tom? Yeah. Are you seeing that? Is that alloyed? <laughs> That's me. Come here, honey. You got to see this. <laughs> <laughs> that's Al. That's Al. He had a band called Al. Al. Altoid. What is it? Altoid and what? Alloyed. A L O I D. Alloyed. Alloyed. And that's me with the sunglasses. Was that CBGBs? Yeah, that's CBGBs. Oh, dude, that's awesome. That's, that that's is, going on my website, Al. That's going on my website. <laughs> oh, man, I'll send it to you, man. Let me tell you, you were the power behind the band. You're the you're the power of. Uh, uh, of everything i'm uh, sure your bands are killing you know uh, you have to send you. me some links and, and make sure your fans are always seeing you know such a such a positive energy coming from you you're amazing thank and, you, and i really thank cherish you. the this uh time that you gave to me and and the rest of the world and uh god bless us all man right on Al. thanks man i appreciate it good for reaching out man thank you peace